Uh, so I'm, I'm down at Emory University in Atlanta. I, I'm not sure if the course with that is. Does anyone come to Emory? Faculty yeah. from, from Fort Smith? Yes, okay. Good. Good, good. I mean, we, we, we have, we have you know, pretty high ranking in U.S. News and World Report. We're usually maybe 16, 17 uh, around there. If some of you are, in fact, thinking of, of looking at Emory, you, you can send me, send me a few questions, and I'll, I'm happy to respond if you want. I'll give you straight answers about, about Emory and strengths. Uh, it has considerable strengths, a few weaknesses. Uh, but I'm happy to to to, to apply. If you're, if you're doing a campus visit, I want to stop by my office. Now uh, I teach a lot of freshman classes, which means I'm getting students three months after they graduated in a whole different environment. They're away from home, uh, away from you know the, the the school, their friends, the teachers whom they saw every day. So it's a whole new world uh, going into college. And you, you see a lot of students who are, who are doing well in, in adjusting, and a few who aren't doing well. And so uh, I, I ended up talking to a lot of students about that adjustment and about things that they might consider and things that they might do beyond just you know, their, their schoolwork and, uh, and the socializing. And so this is you know, my, my list of five, uh, just five things. They're specific, a little offbeat. I'll, I'll, I'll make it pretty quick so we can have some questions and uh, go back and forth a little bit. Uh, th so that this list, I mean, you're going to get advice from students, other students in college, advice like, you know, never sign up for a class before 12 o'clock, right? noon, you want to sleep in. Or, or you know, the, the weekend officially begins on Thursday at 5 p.m. So things like that. This is the kind of thing that you might hear now and then. This is a different list uh, for you. All right. One thing, you know, a lot of students come to college and they do suffer from feelings of loneliness. Right? Loneliness can be very strong. Again, they're in a new place, distant from friends, from teachers, uh, high school teachers whom they form relationships with. And sometimes that leads them into social interactions that aren't the healthiest ones, that, that, that don't promote their intellectual and emotional growth. And so one thing that it is important to do, especially in an age when you are constantly connected, right? You're, you're constantly tied into social media. You can be in the backseat of your parents' car on Highway 95, you know, in the middle of the, the country, and you can be conducting a social life, right, uh, online. You, 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 you can constantly be with one another through, uh, through the tools, the devices. Here is one thing that I urge you to do. This is number one. Try to work in a ritual of solitude for yourselves each day. A time when you are by yourself. You're not connected. You don't have the phone on. You're away from, from the tablet or the laptop. You're not in the company of your friends. You have no TV on. Not even any music uh, unless it is more, more somber music suited to more solitary, reflective moments. This could be you're going out, you know, each morning you go take a walk, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, by yourself, without that device. It could be, you know, you do some, some meditation exercises in the morning. It could be uh, every day after lunch you go over to the chapel on campus and you sit down in one of the pews. You may pray. You may just sit there and, and be by yourself. Okay? You are alone with your own thoughts, wherever those thoughts may go. And one, this gets you out of you know, the rush of social life and academic life as well. Uh, two, it's a place where you can feel grounded. You're, 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 not feel grounded. you're looking for a ground. In, in your solitude. Your ground could be the Lord. Your ground could be nature. It could be, you know, you're doing some, you know, some martial arts exercises or, or, or something, which, which I try to get in every morning. Uh, something like that is just you and yourself. Okay? And that is a way for you 
to kind of regain your, re regain some ground after all the hustle. How often does Jesus in the gospel say, go off by himself, right? He has to leave the crowds. He has to leave the, the, the others and be by himself. Now, he is with God at that time, so he's not really by himself, but this is the kind of thing that you need to cultivate for yourself. And it helps you acquire one of the crucial features of adulthood, and that is learning to be alone. Right? Learning how to be alone. Realizing that that impulse, when you're walking along somewhere, you say, who can I call, right? Who can I make contact with? Let's not let that impulse overpower your capacity to be alone. And part of this is learning to be alone without letting the loneliness get too, too strong. So that's number one, right? A ritual of solitude for yourself. Uh, two, um, we were talking about this last night, the importance of talking to your teacher. A lot of students go to college, they never go visit their professors in their offices. And a lot of professors are very distant figures. They're busy, they're doing their research, they come to class, you see them a couple of hours a week, they go off, you go off. You do your syllabus, your assignments, and everything's right. Try to make your classes more than that. Make them an experience with your teacher. Go in during office hours, the teacher has, and you can talk about the materials on the syllabus, the readings, the assignments, but also, you can see if you can expand the conversation to bigger things, like you know, what courses you might take next year, your interest in, in this or that major. Now, part of this is so that you can learn more things about the life of the college and the life of the mind that that professor represents. But there's an added thing to it. Many students who are at Emory are actually a little uncomfortable talking to someone who is far outside their own age group. Uh, one thing that the digital world does is provide contact in a mode that scientists, social scientists call age segregation. Because you have these tools, you can have constant communication with people your own age. And you can have this intensification of the, the horizontal sphere. 17 year olds talk to other 17 year olds. <laughs> Many students then come to college and they're not at ease talking to 40 year olds or 50 year olds. And you can see that happening when you try to engage with them. I make students come to my office and talk to me a lot. And uh, what, what I see is this student is going to struggle when there's an internship over the summer. And that student has to interview for the internship with three people who are 50 years old. And the, 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 the connection just, just doesn't happen. Now, one thing I see, and I can tell just from the, the little interactions I've had with the students here, you, you guys are comfortable with people older than you. And you're, you're mingling together all the time, which is, a, which is a very good thing. You want to keep that up when you go to college. And these are people who are going to be strangers to you. The professor, you've never seen the professor, you just, just met the professor, just in class. There, there's a distance. Try to walk into that professor's office and practice the ability to have conversation with that person, back and forth about ideas, things going on in, in culture, in politics, uh, whatever. But try to make that part of every course experience. Engagement with your teachers outside of class. So that, that, that's two. Three, take a newspaper and read it. Have it delivered to your door in paper form. Make the newspaper part of your daily life. You get up in the morning, there's the newspaper, you have your, your coffee, your tea, your oatmeal, and you read the newspaper at the same time. 15 or 20 minutes, you don't have to read every article in the newspaper, I don't read every article that I get in, in the newspapers that I receive, but what you're doing is you're, you're, you're gradually assimilating what's going on in the world. What are the important things? 
Who are the important people? What are the important ideas? What are the debates over at this time? And what this is going to do over two or three, four or five months, you're going to find that you have more, not only more information in your head, but you're going to have just a larger awareness of things. So that, this is related to number two, you're going to have more to talk about when you encounter strangers, when you encounter your professors. You're going to bring more to the table. Your professors are not going to be interested in your social lives. They're not going to be interested in a lot of the materials of youth culture. The newspaper is a way for you to broaden what you have to say. You're going to find that when you go out to lunch with those people who interview you, you've done a professional interview, they like you, there are three of them, they're 50 years old, you're going to go out to lunch with them, and that is a social occasion. What are you going to talk about? Okay. What, what are you going to share with them? They're going to be looking at you and think, what do you bring to the table? If they see you know, this, this person knows something about politics, about America, about international uh, foreign affairs, that is going to make you look like you belong there. You bring something to the table. And, and this, this is what's going to happen to you. It's going to make you a more interesting human being. So take the newspaper. Okay? Just, just go through, look at some of the articles that interest you, just pick up the headlines of the others, read the opinion and commentary pages as well. It doesn't matter, it could be a local paper, it could be one of the, you know, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, any, any of those. But just think that the, the newspaper is, is an important part of growing up and becoming a citizen. This is why the Founding Fathers put the freedom of the press in the First Amendment. You know what the Founding Fathers thought of newspaper reporters? They despised them. They hated the press. Abraham Lincoln hated reporters. So did George Washington. But they said they are a necessary part of an informed citizenry. Okay. So this is part of your civic duty to read uh, a newspaper. So that's three. Uh, four, as you're going through your college career, you're going to have your coursework, you're going to have your professional ambitions, what's due to your major. Uh, here's what I would say, cultivate an outside interest of your own. Okay? Try to become an amateur connoisseur of something. This could be, uh, it, this could be anything, it could be you collect things. You know, you, 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 you could collect, you know, fountain pens. You know, I know people who, who, who've collected fountain pens, they go on eBay, they get these old vintage fountain pens from 1930, uh, pens and pencils. And, and they've got their, their, their little collection and they know something about that. They know what Pelican issued in a series in, in, in the late 1930s. And actually, it doesn't really cost very much money. You can build your collection over time. It could be that you've got a particular interest in classical music. It's not part of your, it's not part of your, your, your course of study. But you go to record stores, you get old albums of classical music, and you read about them, you know about them. It's just kind of a, a, a side issue, a side interest. I mean, I, I went once to a luncheon. This was in Georgetown, in Washington, D.C. Got invited to this luncheon, about 20 of us, by uh, a man who was a big legal figure in the Republican Party. He was the Solicitor General under Bush 1, uh, Bush 1's term. He had a very nice mansion in, in, in Georgetown. And we came, and I thought that he was going to speak at the luncheon as well, and I thought it was going to be about politics and you know, the war on terror or something about political policy. But he got up and he gave a little talk. It was about the Venetian Republic in the 14th century. Venice, the traders, the incipient forms of capitalism that the Venetian Republic had developed and democracy. And he looked around his house, he had all these prints of Venice. This might be 18th century prints or paintings. And it was clearly a little hobby of his. It was a passion for him, and he knew a lot about it, and he wanted to share that with us. That made him a more interesting human being. 
right? Someone who isn't just about politics. He's got he's got this this interesting this far away thing. You want to say, why is he so interesting? Well, it represented something to him. The Venetian Republic was a set of ideals of of market capitalism, the creation of wealth, and forms of equality that relative to the time were more advanced there in the Venetian Republic. So that, that, that's something that I, that I encourage you to think about what, where your interests, your passions, they may not be part of your career, but they're part of your, your, your life and, and they're part of your, your development as well. Okay, finally, uh, this, this is, this is uh, something about, about uh, your writing. Okay, this, this is a little, a little off the wall. When you're writing your papers in college, write your first draft by hand. Okay. Don't write it on the computer. Go to the library, go to a place where you're not connected, and pull out your pencil, piece of paper, and write out your first draft. You've got a little dictionary, you have a, a book dictionary, not, not the computer dictionary, and a, and a book thesaurus as well. Write your sentences by hand. Don't put it on the computer until you're pretty satisfied with your first draft. I actually, when I teach freshman, I, I make students turn in papers written by hand. And I say I prefer cursive as well. They look at me like, you know, that, that, that's crazy. But I've had enough of them say over the years that, you know, when you made me write the papers by hand, I slowed down. I took a little more time choosing this verb instead of that verb. I polished the sentences a bit more. I would write it and somehow I would cross that out and rewrite it and improve upon it by writing it by hand. It was more work, but it actually ended up being less work to get to better prose. And it showed. So th those are those are my my five uh, five things. And we can we can have some questions. What kind of newspaper do I prefer? You know, I, what I usually have done is I, I take the Wall Street Journal, um, wherever I've been, and then also a local paper. You know, we lived in Boulder, Colorado for a year, a few years ago. And I took the Wall Street Journal and the Denver Post. Okay, so I like getting, you know, when I'm in Atlanta, we, we, we take the Wall Street Journal and the Atlanta Journal Constitution as well. Now, uh, one of the big issues in media today is how much bias there is, right? How untrustworthy they are. This is not a new claim, you know. Uh, uh, when Abraham Lincoln was running a cabinet meeting and they were talking about a policy with all of his, all of his secretaries of state and war, and someone said, uh, someone said, look, uh, uh, you know, how are we going to run this with the press? They're so unreliable. And Lincoln, Lincoln popped up. Lincoln would do these kinds of offbeat things. He said, no, 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 the press is very reliable. They lie, and they re-lie, and they re-lie and lie. They're very reliable. So that, 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 that was his apologies for always complaining about bias. So it, it, uh, it, it, and the Wall Street Journal has a particular kind of conservative point of view. The New York Times is solidly Northeastern liberal point of view. I actually read the New York Times. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Northeastern liberal, but I read the New York Times, and I think it's important to know what, what, what the New York Times is saying. So, uh, I, I, any, any, any solid newspaper, national or local. So, my, my advice on affording college, I mean, look, look I, I, I am so ill-equipped for that because when Michael and I were at UCLA, when I started UCLA, I was an undergraduate there in 1977. Uh, the registration fees, as they were called, were, were about $130 a quarter. So about, about, about $400 a year was, was UCLA. These, these sticker prices now, they're overwhelming. Um, I mean, you want to get out with as little debt as as possible. And it's so easy to not realize what you're signing up for when you see that, that college cost taking taking place. I I don't I don't know. 
Um, I'm
Peer pressure is very high, especially in a social media age. About 80% of young people with a cell phone or device sleep with it right there by the pillow or on the, on the nightstand in the on position. Okay? They want to be awakened at 2 in the morning if some cool photos come through, uh, something like that. And so this makes your choice of friends very important. They influence you. When we have peer pressure, you want your friends to put good intellectual and spiritual pressure on you. You want them to represent something that you want to be. So uh, if you take that newspaper, as I advise, and your roommate says, what are you reading that stuff for? You need a different roommate. If you have friends who never, you don't feel like they're opening you up. They're, they're not doing something that is going to help you grow and, and develop. Uh, if they mock your religious feelings, yeah, it's time to make new friends. So that, that, I think that's the bigger, the bigger question about the fraternities that you join. Some of those fraternities are going to have people that you want to have as your friends. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't, want to, you don't want to immerse yourself in them. And that's part of the issue of feeling comfortable being alone. Okay? Being alone. Don't let the loneliness lead you into the wrong friendships, which, which can happen a, a lot. Is there a list of five things not to do in college? <laughs> There's a list of a thousand things not to do in college. Okay. So, don't cheat. You know, uh, the Ten Commandments will start with this. Uh, for, for that. But look, look, it's easy to get ungrounded. Let's put it back. And, and so, you know, you have all the temptations in, in college, and we are all fallen creatures, and I succumb to them many times, you, you'll succumb to them many times. The important thing is that you can come back. There is, you, you maintain a place to go. You hear a lot of talk about safe spaces on college campuses. The chapel, okay? It's a safe space. Go, go, go. You, you, you've got, you've got the, 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 the holy space there. That, you, you maintain those places to return to. The two or three good friends, I mean the deep friends who understand you, who, the kind of people who you can be away from for three years, you'll, you'll find this when you go, the friends who you don't talk to for three years, you talk to that person and in five minutes you're right back where you were before. Okay? That's, that's a real friend. And you can't have 300 of those. If you have five real friends when you're 30 years old, that's good. Okay. That, that, that's pretty good. You don't want to try to build this huge network because you, you, there isn't that much of you to go into friendship, the real deep meaning of, of friendship. So but instead of saying, oh, I mean, the million things that you shouldn't do in college, what will save you from those if you have, again, a, pl a place to go, a place to return to, that brings you back from, from those, those, those vacancies. What hobby did I you know, You know, I, uh, well, for, for, you know, I don't want to go to the hobbies, the, 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 the God was 18, 19, and 20. Uh, that, that's, that's the implicit point here. But, you know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, the hobbies I have, uh, I have now, you know, I have, you know, I, I have, uh, you know, I, I, I have some fountain pens. I think they're cool. <laughs> right? You know, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, a few. I hated. I, I just, I, I just hated the sound of opera. My father used to blast it in the house, and it, it's like trauma to me to hear any opera. A couple of years ago, I, I, I heard a little opera. Something clicked on, on you know, my poor wife. Uh, the, the opera. You know, she has to hear Wagner booming. She shuts the door, tries to enclose me in. So, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I go to the opera whenever I can. Just, I'll go to the, you know, five minutes before, and I'll stand in the back uh, to listen to it. So that, that, that's, uh, those are 
Those are those are two things. It used to be UCLA football, but oh, this, it is too painful. So, this year was bad. But they, they had a good basketball in this week. They beat the number one team, Kentucky. So, sorry. You know, it, it, it really is a problem in classrooms because, first of all, some subjects are leading people to be so frightened to open their mouths. Race. Oh, everyone gets nervous about and I teach I teach American literature, I teach African American literature and history. And you know, racial tensions are there in the works. Huck Finn has the N-word in it, and Frederick Douglass uh, does does too. And I, I teach these works, and it really is uh, a uh, I don't know, stifling is the word, but the, the nervous tension in the air is very powerful. And uh, I, I see this about some issues of sexuality uh, as, as well. Um, it's getting worse. You know, the political correctness uh, issue, I'm not sure if that's the right word for it at this point. But people are censoring themselves a great deal on college campuses, and they've learned to, because very often if you say the wrong thing, if you let the, the wrong words slip out of your mouth at a weak moment, then you can be punished. You know, people will get you on, on camera, or uh, they'll, they'll make a complaint or something, and uh, I think the we do have to lower our sensitivities and accept that when you're in a country with the First Amendment, with free speech issues, you're going to bump into irritating things, sometimes offending things. It's just going to happen when human beings with all these mixed motives and lesser impulses mingle. And most of the time, we've got to just shrug and walk away and let, let these things, let the, the feelings of offense just dissipate. My fear is that, we, that the sensitivities have become so high that we're losing the space for people to make mistakes, right? to, to be stupid, and to forgive them. For, for that, and that much of this campaign, right, the last election, was about this issue. You know, Donald Trump's offensiveness was a very you know, daily discussion point in, in the press, and I think much of the support for him, people in this bit, the support for him was uh, some impatience from people feeling like they're constantly under surveillance, that we're constantly <coughs> under suspicion, and that we just have to lower, you know, lower, lower the, lower the heat on this, and accept one another as fallen beings, and. Uh, Unless it passes a certain point, then we can act against it. But right now, the bar is way too low on our reaction to, to uh, uh, impolitic social attitudes. What, what would I like to see trigger warnings in safe space uh, discussions just become absent? Well, you know, there is a, there, there's a common sense side of this. Uh, letting students know we got stuff in this book, this novel that that, that, that can be pretty, pretty pretty hard for some people, and let it go with that. Right? It, it isn't in principle that trigger warnings, which is sort of the announcement at the beginning. This material contains the main, you may find offensive, and you may want to. That is again a, a commonsensical statement as part of teaching, letting students know what's, what's in the book. Uh, but there is a point, again, at which 
this turns into a form of fear. Right? There's something bad in this book, and it may be bad for you. And what this does is elevate people's responses to, I think, pathological levels. And that while we understand something can be upsetting, I mean, one of the things about literature, art, is it can be profoundly affecting in all different directions, good and bad. Right? People can identify with characters for bad reasons. And this is sort of the, the hazardousness of, of art, literature, and music. And what we need to do in a college classroom is acknowledge the power of these materials. But if people are going to respond irrationally to them, which is what the trigger warning is about, you are going to be triggered by this. In other words, it's not a rational response, right? It's an instantaneous trauma that people feel that is going to interfere with your capacity to respond rationally to this. That is really a question for the a different activity. I mean, that, that's, that's a time where you say, a student comes into my office and, and says, I, I couldn't even think straight after reading this book. Then, then I would say, okay, then there are issues. I, I don't mean this in any demeaning way. I said, there are personal issues that you need to address for you. Not intellectual issues. I mean, this is something for counseling. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I genuinely mean this is, these are emotional issues that you need to work out. And I can help you. I can talk to you about this material in the book all you want. But I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified to discuss the fact that it triggers you. That, that, that really is a personal thing. To ref and I should refer you to the, the academic counselors. And I actually frequently refer students to academic counselors, not, not, for, not for this, for many other reasons. Students say, I'm having a really hard time. And I say, we can help you with this. And I get on the phone. And I, I, I say, we have people who are here to help you work through this. That is where I think the, the, the triggering experience needs to be conducted, and that the classroom, beyond that common sense, we've gone too far. Right. You ask your upper division people whom you meet. You join a fraternity. You ask, you know, that's a way to find out from the juniors and seniors who's good, who can I talk to. You, if, if you're politically minded, there are college Democrat clubs, there are college Republican clubs. They will connect you with professors who can who, who can you can talk to about about politics and have some congenial build a congenial relationship with them. Uh, if you if you don't know where you're going, you have no idea what you're interested in, okay? That's, you, you've got a great year ahead of you. You just explore. Okay, you're gonna take a course in art history from the Renaissance to the present. You look at pictures. You know, you talk about beauty in art. You take you take music history. You take a course in jazz. You know, jazz history. You you can you can take a course in in political theory, you know, political science. Read read about American elections. I, I I would say that the condition of not knowing where you want to go, don't panic. Right? This is this is a year. You don't have to decide on a major really until the end of your your second year. And some of them. Your pre-med from the start, you, 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 can, uh, you can actually hold off on that uh, uh, a little bit and say, this is my chance to look around here. I can, I, can, uh, I can breathe a little bit. I've got to fulfill these general education requirements anyway, where you take the work in humanities and social sciences. Uh, you, you should look upon those courses not as something to check off the list, 
but an area to go where you can learn about things and perhaps find what, uh, find where your interests go, and then the professors with whom you can build that, uh, build that relationship too. And that's part of going in and talking to your professors. Some of them are going to be off-putting. They don't want to be bothered. They're busy. Actually, that's a good experience for you. To go in and talk to a professor and have it not go that well. He's not interested. That's a good experience for you to have. The second time it happens, it won't be really that upsetting. Okay? You'll have been there, done that, and you'll know how to respond in that situation better the second time and, and the third time. But go, going in, yeah, talking to your professors, and you can tell from the way they act at the podium if this is a simpatico person for you or, or, or not. But I think that, that just I think that will tend naturally to happen if you make the effort. You can drift through college and never, never really form a strong relationship with professors, but I think that's a lost opportunity.